back to Cincinnati Zoo Tales. I'm Jenna. And I'm Mark. Thanks to all you listeners for tuning in to yet another great episode we have lined up today. We're being joined by one returning guest, one new guest, uh, Tara Lay and Remy Romaine, both keepers in our North America department. Tara's our returning guest. We clearly didn't scare you off the first time, so we're glad to have you back. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me again. I'm really happy to be here. And Remy, thanks to you for joining for the first time. We're yeah, excited to have you. Really excited. So, like I said, two keepers from our North America department here today. We're here to talk about maybe one of your cutest animals that you take care of. I, I'm interested to hear your opinion on it. But we're here to talk about otters, so thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having us. We'll take any excuse to talk about otters that we can, so no worries. <laughs> Before we talk about the really cute otters, will you both introduce yourselves and tell us a little bit about how you became zookeepers, where you got your start? Yeah, so... I started actually at a wildlife sanctuary out in Indiana, working with a lot of North American wildlife, so wolves, coyotes, foxes, possums, bears, anything of that nature. And then I interned at Cincinnati Zoo in our ambassador department before making my way into our North American department. So I've been here about three years, and I have to say the otters are up there in my favorites, but don't tell our other animals. Yeah. <laughs> your we always try and get people here. to tell us your favorites, a lot of people don't want to. <laughs> Yeah, I also, just like Tara, I started at the zoo as an intern with our animal excellence scientist. And from there, I moved into Wild Encounters, which is our animal ambassador program, and then into Children's Zoo, where I worked as a keeper, and I helped out with the Barnyard Bonanza shows that they've got over there that are a ton of fun. Definitely. Yeah. yeah, they're a ton of fun, and they've got a lot of training, and so I really, really love training, and that's one of the my the reasons that I really love the river otters as well, because it's a ton of fun, interesting training to do. So from Children's Zoo, I moved over to North America, and now I get to hang out with all those cool critters. That's awesome. You both kind of got a quick start here, considering like most of us take like five years or more to get a full-time job. So congrats <laughs> to you guys. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, also, it was around five years. <laughs> we count those blessings. Yeah. <laughs> so. No, props to both of you, for sure. Thank you. Uh, would you guys tell us for just a moment, like, what exactly the North America department takes care of, right? Because that department has changed a little bit over the years here at the zoo. So what all animals you work with more than just otters? What all do you work with? Yeah, so we are we are a merge of two different departments, basically. It used to be uh, the Bear Line Department and the Manatee Springs Department. Um, so we used to take care of all of the bears, in addition to the old sea lions, uh, otters, wolves, uh, foxes, a singular owl, um, <laughs> a singular sweet perfect owl. Um, so we take care of all of those. Obviously we no longer have sea lions or bears, but we still have foxes, wolves, otters. Um, and in addition to that, we also now work with manatee springs. So that's our Florida manatees, as well as a number of different species of gar and some turtles as well. That's a good mix. It yeah. is, yeah. It's fun to get kind of like the the marine life and then the yeah. terrestrial life as well. A little bit of both, yeah. I think it's the best of both worlds. Yeah. <laughs> I get my wolves and my carnivores and my marine mammals, yeah. so I can't complain. Yeah, you get to do all of the fun stuff on land, and then you just get to go scuba diving with the manatees, right? too. That sounds awesome. Do you guys have, like, primary areas that you focus on, or do you work a different routine every day, or how does that look? We have our set schedules, like whoever is usually doing our closing routine will be our floater, but then we kind of are divvied up pretty evenly between the areas. It also can just depend on staffing and availability if we have big projects like our manatee physicals or any of our projects in our wolf yard we might scatter, but I would say we're a pretty even yeah. split. And I'm really happy with that. I like to be in both areas because I love them all. And yeah. there's so many cool things in both areas. It's really, like I already said, but the best of both worlds. Yeah. Definitely. Awesome. Well, today we will focus on our North American river otters. Um, do you guys want to tell us about the two that we have here first, or do you want to tell us about otters in general first? Hmm. We can always start with just uh, yeah. uh, our, just do a little introduction of our own. Okay. So we're a little biased, so we might want to mention them first. Sure, <laughs> go for it. Uh, we have uh, two North American river otters. It's one of two species of otters that are native to the United States. Um, their names are Sugar and Wesley, one female, one male. Sugar is 10 years old, and Wesley is 11 years old currently. 
Um, they are two very, very playful, very, very smart, very energetic, um, talented swimmers, talented trainers, just all around swell little critters. <laughs> <laughs> because they do train us too. Yeah, they, they 100% train ways. us. Yeah. So. <laughs> Sugar knows what's what. She's a smart cookie. So Sugar's 10, Wesley's 11. Yes. What, what's going to be their life expectancy? Uh, in human care, we expect somewhere late teens, early 20s. Okay. That's pretty standard. Um, in the wild, you'll expect to see them, obviously, a lot less, maybe early teens, just because lack of vet care. They have to go find sure. their food every day, all that's good stuff. So, yeah, we've got a little bit longer life expectancy. And so they are, I, I like to call them like middle age right now. Almost. Yes, for those in human care, if they were wild otters, they would probably be considered more in the geriatric, like Remy had said, that early teens at 10 to 13. So we would call Wesley an old man by wild standards. But okay. He's young at heart. He's yeah. young at heart. And <laughs> in health. <laughs> yeah, and in health. He's, yeah. He's, they're great. <laughs> How do you guys tell the two of them apart? So we look at their physical attributes mostly because once you learn them, you'll look at personalities and you know who's getting in trouble. <clears throat> sugar. <laughs> but our female sugar, she is slightly bigger, which is a little typical of river or atypical of river otters just because usually males are bigger than females in most mammal species, but she's just the big girl. So she is much darker, has a larger nose, and then just bigger in size, where little Mr. Wesley is smaller. He's got a white chest and a smaller nose. And he's usually probably napping on his back on a hammock <laughs> or in the log while sugar is looking for something mischievous yeah. or, or my personal favorite which is double decker otters when sugar's lying on top of a bed and wesley is sleeping underneath the Aww. Bed. Aww. <laughs> very cute they're so fun to see they're the best i know people love them here um and there's probably a lot of things they do that are entertaining but do you guys have any special enrichment or things that you do to entertain them <laughs> yes so it's always a project to come up with new things to challenge sugar uh they're both great enrichment sugar particularly enjoys being challenged uh some of my favorite things to do um involve catering to her favorite activities <laughs> i like to tell uh what she likes to do when we put kitty pools out in the yard so you'll just fill a small like dog-sized pool with water and her and you want them to go swimming in it her favorite thing in the world is to flip it over. <laughs> How does she manage to flip it yeah, over? Yeah, you wouldn't pool? think so. That's she insane. She <laughs> shoves her head underneath it and just like gets it just so her shoulders are underneath it. And she's got enough leverage and enough strength. They are incredibly strong that she can flip the whole thing over. And she'll use different parts of the habitat to her advantage. <laughs> like she knows where all the stream edges are, where the good rocks oh, for yeah. shoving oh, are. Oh my gosh. So she is very, very talented. So I, I, I like making types of enrichment that involve her destroying things or otherwise knocking things over. It's a simple one, but large cardboard boxes. We'll put them out, fill them up, and close them, like completely close them up, so that she has to knock it over and then usually rip it apart. So really kind of engaging her natural destructiveness in a fun, productive way in which at the end of it, she... Not only gets food that's inside the box, but then she gets to roll around and groom on the cardboard mm. and the and the straw inside and whatever <laughs> else we decide to put in there. If you put like an empty like pool in there, would she still want to dump it, or does yes. she see you put all the work in and she's yeah. like, "I just want to undo this." And <laughs> so she just wants to flip things upside yes. down. Yeah. She just wants to see what happens when she flips. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's just an urge. She like will flip anything she can, whether it's her dome house. Yeah. Fire hose beds, and if she's not flipping the kiddie pool, she's sitting inside the little turtle head of yeah. it because she fits perfectly in there. Oh so my gosh. she'll hide until she can flip it when yeah. Wesley's enjoying it, probably. <laughs> to, yeah. <laughs> to, to be fair for sugar, it usually pays off because we do a lot of puzzle feeders, mm -hmm. uh, things like balls with only one hole in them. Uh, we call it a nose it. Um, where she has to flip it and turn it all different ways until she gets the hole oriented right and then fish will fall out for her. So it usually pays off for her to flip things. <laughs> so I don't blame her for doing it. She just has a, a unique zest for it. <laughs> <laughs> so she sounds like trouble. Does uh, Wesley have his own little personality quirk? Yeah, Wesley is... 
He's kind of like your dog, I feel like. Very friendly, loyal, and sweet, um, but very big goofy boy. And I think with him and Enrichment, it's always finding the balance of challenging him, but not to where he's like, this is too hard and I'm done. Oh, he'll so, just quit if it's too yeah, difficult. Yeah, he'll <laughs> quit if it's too difficult or he waits until Sugar figures it out a little bit. So he really is engaged mostly with things with food. Yeah. But we do see him rub and groom on a lot of things. And I would say his favorite enrichment, and I guess napping counts. Yeah. But it would definitely be his fire hose hammocks. Okay. Awesome. So tell us a little bit about river otters in general, like their natural history, uh, where people might be able to see them in the wild, that sort of thing. Uh, well, North American river otters were, they've got an interesting history, um, particularly across the continent. So they were once found throughout uh, North America, U.S. and Canada. They were found all over the place. And then in uh, 1800s, they were actually um, hunted extensively for their fur. Mm. Their fur is very warm, very insulating, and pretty waterproof as well. So they were hunted extensively, and that combined with habitat degradation, so water pollution, deforestation, etc. Mm. They were basically wiped out from a lot of the states in central and eastern, um, central and eastern United States. Uh, in Ohio. Their, their interesting story is that there's been a number of reintroduction programs to get them further east. Again. Oh, interesting. In Ohio, it was 1986 that they were reintroduced. They actually captured 123 wild otters from Louisiana and Arkansas and then brought them to Ohio and released them into some of the more rural eastern watersheds in Ohio. And they are a very cool success story for what conservation looks like because one of the big reasons they were able to come back make a comeback here was because of the clean water act i was gonna ask was there something that helped them be successful or like stop the hunting or yeah so the clean water act there was far more strict regulations on hunting um that combined with the reintroduction program actually means that they are now pretty common in ohio they okay. can be found in 83 out of the 88 counties wow. in ohio that's, if I remember correctly, about 75 different watersheds in Ohio. Um, so they can be found all over in Ohio. So it's a really cool success story for them. Now that doesn't mean you'll see them in the Cincinnati River, in the Ohio <laughs> River in downtown Cincinnati. Uh, they do still need the nice clean waterways. They also tend to like it a little slower moving, yeah. um, a little more rural. They can be pretty secluded critters. A lot of times you'll see signs of them, but not the actual otters themselves because they will see you first and just dip right into the water. <laughs> so the, the clean water makes sense. Like what animal wouldn't want that? But is there something very specific? Like is it something they eat that can only be found in clean water? Or like how does that play a role in it and their success? Yeah, so river otters, they rely on different types of waterways for their habitat, for courtship, for finding food obviously for water. So without those waterways, they're not having things like fish or frogs, other amphibians, invertebrates that they can find and they can hunt. And then they spend, I would say it's about an and even 50-50 on land, on water. Would you agree, Remy? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We spend so, a lot of time on both. So they are not like sea otters where they are required to be in the water the entire time, but that water is it is their home, it is how they travel, it is where they find their food. And river otters are really sensitive to poor water quality and water pollution. So they're what we call an indicator species. So as Remy said, you're probably not gonna see them in the Ohio River. And as we know, the Ohio River has experienced a lot of environmental changes. So anytime a guest asks me where they're most likely to see them, I always say Arnold's Creek in Indiana is where I've seen them, but cool. it's a very rural area out in Rising Sun. <laughs> so. With them being an indicator species, they just rely on those waterways for food and for their homes, like I said, courtship and travel. So it's pretty much their lifeline. Without it, they would not be river otters. <laughs> yeah, they, they've got, I, I think it's about like five mile ranges. But when you look at range maps of otters, you'll actually see that it is right on the edge of the waterway. Oh, They're okay. never venturing okay. far from the waterway unless it is to move between waterways. Okay. Mm. So even though they can have large ranges, it's always centered on water. That Do they so need to be on rivers, or can you find them in lakes and ponds sometimes, too? You can find them in lakes and ponds. You can actually find them in the ocean, too. Wow. It's not super well known, but they can 
be great hunters in salt water. They just need to have access to fresh water. Okay, I didn't know that. Yeah. I didn't know that either. That's really interesting. It's for, yeah. obviously for drinking, but one thing you don't consider is it's for grooming too. Uh, otters have incredibly thick fur. With river otters, it's like 400,000 hairs per square inch wow. of fur. It is so very thick. And the way it insulates and keeps them dry is by trapping hair, air. So their fur traps air against their skin, which keeps their skin dry and keeps them nice and toasty warm. Um, so when they enter into seawater, the salt actually interrupts all of the oh. air they've trapped. So they regularly have to leave the salt water and go bathe in fresh water. Okay. Bathe, dry out, groom themselves to get all of that air back where it needs to go. Make sure they're nice and warm and dry. Are those the same? Like, are there subspecies of North American river otters? Or are they all, like, some just live further south and some can live really far north? Yeah, they're all considered, I believe, the same huh. species. Yep. Just like Sugar and Wesley are a perfect example. So Sugar was born in Massachusetts and Wesley was born in South Carolina. But they're considered the same species. Okay. Yeah. So um, just to circle back also to your question of why we were talking about how otters spend their day and their ranges, they spend about 40 to 60% of their day foraging. And as primarily piscivores, that's another reason that they're focused on those waterways. That mm -hmm. makes sense. I was going to ask, what does their, their diet look like in the wild versus what we feed them here at the Cincinnati Zoo? Like, how does that compare? Yeah, so the, in the wild, it is predominantly fish. It's predominantly kind of slow-moving uh, bottom-feeding fish. That's pretty common. They can get all sorts of different types of fish. They can get all different types of sizes of fish, too. And they are opportunistic in terms of eating other things. So they have been known to eat things like amphibians, uh, small mammals, uh, small birds, eggs, invertebrates, like earthworms and, and other sorts of invertebrates. Um, here at the zoo, we try and mimic that. So the vast majority of their diet is fish, mm. and they have to eat a lot of it every day. <laughs> they have to eat a ton of fish because they're in and out of the water. It's really high energetic demands. So mostly fish, and then we supplement it with other things that they might naturally get. Uh, they really, one of their favorites is earthworms. I was going to say, do they have favorite fish too? <laughs> like our pelicans can be picky, or yeah. our stork likes certain oh. fish, like... Do Wesley's changes depending on his week. <laughs> okay. um, right now we're taking a strike against anchovies, <laughs> but I think sugar's pretty solid and always liking lake smelt. Yeah. Okay. Smelt, like smelt. Okay. Yeah. I do love when they eat earthworms though, because they'll grab them and it just looks like spaghetti hanging out of them. <laughs> just slither it down. <laughs> and they'll just drag it into the water and you watch them try and eat it. And it's so funny. It's oh. so cute. Personally, my favorite is their hard boiled yeah. eggs to see their little egg face when they make a mess and it's oh. all over their oh mouth. Oh my god. Yeah. That's fun. Do they, like, how do they hunt? Do they sit and wait for a fish to swim by? Do they swim after fish and grab them? What is their hunting style? They are very active predators. Very yeah, they are very fast swimmers. They can swim like up to about eight miles an hour in the water. Wow. Yeah, um, seven to eight. Yeah, so very, very fast swimmers. They are very active hunters. Do they, they hunt together or is it one otter hunting its own? They're mostly food? solitary okay. animals. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they're kind of like, they're, they're in a weird in between between solitary and vaguely social. Yes, they spend most of the time alone, but when they encounter other otters, they are happy to be around Okay, I don't otters. know why. My brain always thinks there's multiple otters. I do too. Group. I think of yeah. them as more social. Yeah, yeah they yeah, are yeah. considered solitary, but if they're in an area with abundant resources, you may see a group of anywhere from like 8 to 15. So they are like, I would say semi-social yeah. and semi-solitary. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> they just yeah. go with the flow. It, <laughs> yes, exactly. And it may depend on what resources are available in the yeah. area. And what family groups look mm -hmm. like. That may, that makes more sense than like you don't see them as often too because it'd be harder to see just one solitary. Yeah. Yeah. So what does a family group usually look like? So a family group typically looks like a mom and her pups. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes, and m pups usually stay with mom around eight to ten months. Okay. Uh, which is when her next litter would be born. Oh, wow. And it, in some cases, those yearling pups will actually stay for the raising of the new pups. Oh, okay. Uh, but like Tara said, it depends on um, resource abundance. It depends on personality of the otters. It depends on if mom wants them to hang around or if she wants them out. Uh, it really just depends. Uh, but they are, that's the typical family group, although they have also been spotted in the wild in, like, bachelor groups. Okay. So groups of young males 
have been spotted together as well. Just depends. There's, it's very different. And even when they do interact with each other, it tends to be playful, mm -hmm. playful interactions. They are very playful. Maybe animals. that's what my brain thinks. Of, like you know, just otters like playing together yeah. or something. Yeah. Like like where sliding in the snow. Yeah. Or yeah. Together. yeah. They will. Yeah. They are very <laughs> playful. I feel like all the videos that you do see on the internet of them sliding on their belly across snow or playing. They will do that, 100%. If you visit us when we have snow, you will see Wesley sliding. just sliding all the way across. <laughs> Turning his whole habitat into an ice rink, yeah. which is less fun for us than it is yeah. for them. I'm not as good on the ice as he is. <laughs> So what does breeding look like for them? When are they reproductively mature? How do the males come across females? How often does that happen? So they're reprodu they are reproductively mature around... Is it three to five years, I do believe? And so they will start their courtship in the late winter, like around November, typically. And the thing that's a little tough about river otters is they have what we call delayed implantation. Mm -hmm. So if they, so we'll use Sugar and Wesley for an example, as they are a breeding pair here at Cincinnati Zoo. So if they were to have pups, we're probably looking at them from maybe a pregnancy that occurred a year ago. So that's a little hard to imagine, yes. but with delayed implantation, it just does not attach to the uterine wall. So she doesn't necessarily have the baby until roughly 300 or so days later. So once then, if she's determined to not have pups, then they'll kind of go into their breeding season. So for us, we're looking and expecting, we're preparing for pups potentially anytime from December, January to late mid-March, I'll say. Most likely mid-March. These guys, their breeding week, we have a week, we mm -hmm. like to say, where they we really see them getting together for it, but um, it's usually the third week of March only okay. that they do that. Yeah, but delayed implantation makes it pretty difficult for us to tell when she would be giving birth. Because yeah. yeah. um, the implantation yeah. happens anywhere between eight to ten months of after breeding. Wow. Um, and that after implantation, it's about two months of what we would typically think of as pregnancy. Okay. So during that eight to ten month stretch before implantation, you would never know nothing. she's pregnant, know. right? Okay. Yeah. You would notice nothing. And it's almost mm -hmm. impossible to tell whether she is pregnant, even during that two month span. One of the things we've talked about here is like the different ways that you tell an animal is pregnant. I mean, humans, you can take... Uh, uh, can a take pregnancy, pregnancy tests, tests <laughs> uh, which have hormonal indicators of pregnancy. Otters go through what's called pseudo-pregnancy. So yes. sugar every year has all of the hormonal markers and behavioral markers of pregnancy, but ha most of the time she has never been pregnant before. Mm -hmm. And probably the weight gain. Too. Yeah, and she goes through the weight gain <laughs> yeah. as well. She has all of the signs of pregnancy, but she is not pregnant. Int intense nesting behaviors yeah. where she's collecting everything from the habitat and pulling it in into her nest boxes and really trying to set things up. She gets very... Tiffy and tense with <laughs> Wesley. Um, yeah, she does not want him yeah. anywhere near her nest box. Yeah. Uh, so she gets really protective of her space. And so that can all happen without her ever being pregnant. And Which, then our ultrasounds tough because of their fur. Fur, exactly. Because yes. when you think about, mm -hmm. like we were saying, they trap a bunch of air against their skin. Um, and that is the bane of ultrasounds. Yeah. <laughs> you need good contact without any air to get a good ultrasound. So you have to get her ab belly absolutely doused with ultrasound gel. Mm -hmm. And it just, even with that, doesn't work too well. Mm -hmm. So she has been trained for ultrasounds, and she's had them in the past, but it's so difficult to get good pictures that it's basically worthless in terms huh. of actually indicating whether she's pregnant. It would be like getting an ultrasound over a down jacket. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. yeah. Like, good luck. So, yeah. <laughs> good luck with that. It's yeah. not so if you're dressed for the winter, you know, and then go get your ultrasound, maybe in your Carhartt bibs or something. <laughs> yeah. Then, like, that's how they are. But yeah, so as Remy had said, the, it's, it's really hard to tell with that because what this turns out to then is the total gestation time can be anywhere from 290 to 380 days. Wow. But the actual gestation is only about 60. So okay. it gets really tough for us to tell. So we're looking for those signs to see if she is potentially, yeah. but that pseudo-pregnancy is really tricky. Yeah, and we yeah. always prep as if she mm -hmm. is pregnant. 
Although we've never had pups. Oh, that would be so fun if yeah, it ever happened. It happens. would. They would be so cute. We'd love to, but, you know, there is a lot of wonder on if they are the perfect match, biologically speaking. Mm-hmm. Um, there is some differences in where they were born and their development as adults that may have an effect on how successful they are to breed. So t- can you tell us more yeah, about that? absolutely. So... They're learning with river otters that latitude might be a big factor in successful reproduction. And so, as we mentioned, Sugar, she's from Massachusetts, and Wesley is from South Carolina. She's a northerner. She is a northerner. She is a northerner. So, we don't necessarily think that they line up for their hormonal peaks. So, we think Wesley peaks a little early when Sugar's not quite ready Thus, they don't line up in a way that makes them super yeah. successful for that. And that makes a lot of sense when you think about it. Spring comes earlier in the South. It gets warmer mm-hmm. earlier, so it makes sense for breeding, which is very energetically demanding, to happen when there's more food around. It makes sense, but also my brain is like, but they live here. here and and they shouldn't have. their hormones <laughs> kind of go yeah. off of the, the seasons here, That's right? They when they change latitudes, yeah. how does their latitude from birth stick mm-hmm. with them throughout their lives? They're seeing that with bears, different bear yeah. species, really? too. But they yeah. don't, I don't think they, anyone has a really good answer they as don't, to exactly yeah. and it's how like, and why. When I just oh. had attended the Otter Keeper Workshop um, in 2023, they had brought up the latitude conversation. So I think there's a lot of research and things that are going into seeing how much this has effects. But it is a big thing within human care because as we shuffle otters around, are we matching them oh, appropriately yeah. on, no. you know, where they were from? Yeah. And This is sure. never a problem <laughs> in the wild. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah so it's, it's never an issue. Like, you know, you would never think, like, well, a northern... River otter comes to one from South Carolina. Will they work? Will they not? And so they're kind of starting to really look into that and take it into consideration. Wow, so. it's a really important thing to figure out, mm-hmm. and I'm glad they are. Like, But something I never would have thought of. Because, yeah. again, I, yeah. I get how like hormones can shift with like weather and changes yeah. in seasonality and all of that, but they're both in the same seasons now, yeah. so you'd think <laughs> that would... Uh line up at some point. That is fascinating how it would kind of stick with them through their lives. Yeah. It's really interesting for like, you mentioned it's particular with some bear species mm-hmm. as well. Like it's crazy because these animals in the wild would cover such big range, right? They're found mm-hmm. from Canada to Florida, you yeah. know, it's like those are such different habitats and they do have to adapt the way they survive yeah. in those areas. But I, I'm curious to see the new research that comes out on yeah. this. It's fascinating. Yeah, it has been really interesting. I think otter breeding in general is just quite a mystery between the delayed implantation, the mm-hmm. pseudo pregnancy, how do their latitudes match up? So it is really incredible that the reintrodu- reintroduction program was as successful oh, yeah. as it was That's a good point. because mm-hmm. you yeah. know, now we're kind of dealing with all of these changes that it's like how do we make this work? And mm-hmm. to think that they've released over 4,000 otters in 22 states since the 1980s is huge. So Mm -hmm. thankfully we're not on the endangered or threatened list as river otters anymore. And that is reassuring considering there's a lot going into their breeding. I was just going to ask that. And there's habitat loss every day. Mm -hmm. So that's awesome that they're no longer on that list. And every episode we do that talks, has anything to do with breeding, especially mammals. I'm like, there's, it is so complicated. Yeah. I, I cannot believe any species survives. Honestly, like, yeah. every time we talk to Dr. Aaron Curry, I'm like, what are you talking about? I don't <laughs> I understand <laughs> this delayed implantation stuff. Why? Why? You know, like, it is seems so tricky. complicated. It is, like, when you really think about, like you said, everything that goes into reproduction for animals, like, they just do it naturally. They do it right. And they are successful without our intervention. And then you get into human <laughs> care. And it's like... Okay, what am I doing wrong? Yeah, yeah, I don't understand. understand. And they're just like, I don't know. What are you doing wrong? <laughs> That's such a good point. Oh, you mentioned earlier that you, you do a lot of training, Remy. Yeah. Particularly, that's one of your favorite parts of the yeah. job, right? Will you tell us a little bit about the training that you do with the otters? Oh, yeah. So we do a lot of training for a lot of different reasons. Uh, the most important training that I, I'd say we do is for husbandry and veterinary purposes. So basically, the training that we do to take care of them and make sure they are healthy and happy otters. Uh, So that is basic things like moving back and forth when we ask them to, to more complicated things, kind of middling is like opening their mouths so we can see their teeth and tongues Mm -hmm. or offering their paws so we can check on their claws every day. One of the really cool behaviors that they've trained and a lot of the other animals in the zoo have trained for is a voluntary injection behavior. 
So they will come into a crate and they will hold still. Or in Sugar's case, she has to do everything uniquely. So Sugar <laughs> rolls over onto her back and then holds still. <laughs> That's uh, yeah, <laughs> don't know why she decided that one. We it's didn't just decide where that. she's comfortable, yeah. so enough. we Fair. just it works. Yes. Yeah, so she, so she, they do that up against a fence, and you are able to poke them with a needle and give them their regular vaccinations and things like that. Um, so that's like the basic stuff. Some of the training that Tara and I have been really interested in lately is what we call free contact training. So that is going in with the otters and sharing space with them and training. Uh, folks who listen to the podcast and come to the zoo regularly and even follow the zoo on social media uh, might notice pictures of Sugar holding different objects in her hands. A lot of them are dog toys or little rubber things like that. Those are really fun pictures that we get the chance to take with her. Uh, but what you might not realize is one, that's not photoshopped. We've gotten questions about that before. It is real. They are it's cute real. enough to, we work hard to on think that. it might be Photoshop. Uh, but it definitely does look Photoshop sometimes. Uh, but that is a really fun behavior, but it is part of a larger program that we've been working on to have more complex veterinary behaviors. So one of the big things we're working on is getting more tactile contact with them. We're very limited when we are behind the scenes with the animals of what areas of them we can reach and touch. Mm. So being out and sharing space with them, you get the chance to touch a lot more of them. In the future, it's things we're interested in, like maybe doing x-rays. You can't really x-ray through, uh, through metal. Um, so, and that's a lot of our behind the scenes area. So it's one potential that maybe someday we could do x-rays with them free contact. Uh, we can teach different new behaviors. One of the things I say say is, so Sugar is really great at her rollover behavior. Wesley, it has never clicked for him. <laughs> he has not gotten it. Anytime we've tried to train behind the scenes, he it does not click how to roll over. But the interesting thing about going free contact is you have new strategies to train that. You can be directly above the animal. You can work in more three-dimensional space. So we've been able to actually start capturing a rollover behavior with Wesley. Uh, which again is really useful because you can get co full contact on his belly and you can check out uh, his, the, his whole length like that. So you can do all sorts of interesting behaviors. It also gives us the chance to work with them in, in the water, which is not oh, something yeah. that you typically get to do. Uh, sugar in particular, that is her, one of her favorite places to work. She really loves working in the water. Uh, whenever she's reluctant to work with us on land, which is sometimes, she's she's allowed to be have moods and decide what she wants to do on any given day. So she goes into the water and work with her down there instead. So it gives us a lot more flexibility for that. I reason. feel like they're mm -hmm. really, it sounds like they're really smart yeah. and, you know, they like enrichment and things. And this is another way to also stimulate them yeah. and, and like form a stronger bond than you already have and just work with them and like... Yeah. Makes them fun, but also it helps with medical things. And Yeah, and absolutely. Like you said, building that bond. So as Remy had mentioned, Sugar really likes working in the pool. And so sometimes when we're out doing free contact and she's not in the mood for what we're asking, we're just going to ask her what she likes to do in the pool. We're like, okay, you're still going to cooperate. You're still motivated, but we're going to let you know we're here for you too. Yeah. Like this isn't yeah. all about like what we want to accomplish. Like if this is engaging and enriching to you too, then it's Let's an accomplishment on our yeah. part. And I'm sure allowing her to give the choice of, yes. maybe I do yeah. want to train in the pool today. I'm sure that mm -hmm. makes her participate more frequently because she gets to choose oh, what she wants to absolutely. do. Absolutely. Yeah. Sometimes yeah. when yes. we do sessions, uh, she says, I don't really want to work right now. And we're like, okay, how about mm -hmm. in the water? And we work her in the water for a couple minutes. And then we're like, how about on land now? And she's like, yeah, yeah. sure. <laughs> so working her and giving her that choice to do what she wants to do actually helps build trust and build her confidence mm -hmm. in working other places yeah. as well. So it's a really cool dynamic. What behaviors are you doing in the water? Uh, one of her favorites <laughs> is, is a retrieval behavior. I was going to ask it's if she really does that. Yeah. 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 It's, right now, it's a little red plastic ball that floats on top, and you toss it out, and she swims anywhere in the pool mm -hmm. and just pushes it with her nose all Aww. the way back Aww. to you. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, but they are also <laughs> trained for free contact. We have station training. Yeah. They can stand, hold paws. We obviously do target. 
And then we are working with, as Remy had said, Wesley on his rollover. Hopefully we'll get him holding objects one day. That's yeah. a, it's a large goal. But we're focusing a lot on um, how we can incorporate medical behaviors into that free contact. So that way it's not just fun and enriching for them and us, but it can serve larger purposes like other vet procedures that are needed. How did Sugar's... Um her holding things, how did that develop? Like, I'm guessing it, like, came naturally for her, and then you guys captured it, or somebody did, or... So we have to give that credit to Erin Carney. Okay. So she had originally <laughs> trained the behavior. Also the same with Sugar's rollover. She had captured that for her injection training. So Erin was the one who initiated that with Sugar, and she would just work them free contact, yeah. and they would... She was really good about giving paws and, like, to handle things, and I think she just went for it yeah. one day. I think... Because we have a volunteer photographer, Mark, who, who comes by, and he, he saw Aaron working this behavior one day, and he's like, will she hold other things? <laughs> and Aaron was like, I, I, I can't actually speak for Aaron, but yeah. I, I'm pretty yeah. sure Aaron was like, sure, let's try. And, and then it just stopped. <laughs> and so if then... you hand her something, does she just automatically like pose and sit still? Or is it like, like timing? It can kind, kind of... of depend on yeah. what the object itself is. So like when we're warming her up or practicing, we're giving something that's like small and round. So that way she can kind of just like put her hands on it and like almost like you would clap together on something and she'll hold it really well. We recently just tried a little fire cracker toy but it wasn't much a fake fire cracker. Yes, a yes, toy. Yes, a, toy. Yes. a toy a toy yes um a, a, a toy yes thank you for that clarification Remy. um but it was probably about the size of like three markers put together like nothing really big but she was like where do you want me to put my paws? Aww. I don't understand. But we did get her to hold yeah. a pair of Eclipse glasses this year. Oh, fun. She just held them flat. So sometimes if it smells weird, she's not used to mm -hmm. it, or it's a hard size, then we have to find different routes. But if you give her time to sniff it, investigate it, and go at her pace, we can usually get her to hold it by the yeah. end of things. Yeah, I always say she. you have to try it. You have to do one try where she sniffs it. One try where she puts one paw on it, yeah. and then usually on the, on the next try you might get both paws. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and then sometimes when she's done, she just drops it before oh, you can pick it up, and that's when she's like, I'm good. But yeah. We do appreciate Sugar and the way that she will communicate to us. Like She does give polite refusals, and she just is like, I'm just going to go over here, or our favorite is... All of a sudden, I have an itch. I have to scratch, yeah. and it's more important than you. So. <laughs> yeah, when she doesn't want to, when she's not interested in whatever you're offering her, she just starts itching. <laughs> yeah, they sound so like so much fun. I'm just imagining like they're bigger meerkats. If I could get the meerkats to hold something, oh, I would just oh, <laughs> that would be apart. so cute. that would be adorable. <laughs> Absolutely adorable. Well, we can get back to more. Um, important professional oh, things yeah. <laughs> this is so cute, so cute to talk about um so is there anything else like as far as training or enrichment that you guys want to tell us or anything else you can tell us about river otters in general um i think one thing that's kind of fascinating is they are one of 13 otter species in the world i don't think many people realize how many species of otter yeah. there are but in the United States, we just have sea otters and your North American river otters. But there's 13 total, so it's pretty exciting. Yeah. They're found pretty much all over the world as well. Yes, right? Asia, yeah. Africa, mm -hmm. all over. South yes. America, yeah. Yeah. yeah, Europe, they are all and over. They're all sorts of sizes, ranging, yes. from, like, ranging from like small Asian small clawed otters. Which we'll have here soon. Yeah, which yes. we'll have yes. here soon. To the other species we'll have here soon, which is sea otters. otters absolutely massive like some of the largest specimens of sea otters can hit 100 pounds that's amazing huge that's for comparison if you look at wesley and sugar each of them is about 20 pounds oh yeah i'm glad you brought that up yep yeah so and then you have the giant river otters yeah. which are known as the river wolf in south america which i think is really cool yeah. but they'll fight leopards for prey wow. that's pretty awesome yeah, <laughs> they're also they're called river wolf partially because they're very social. They're yes, big. They social. do actually. Okay. Yeah, so semi aquatic. That metaphor. is one thing that kind of changes between otters is yeah. maybe how they live together in groups. Are they solitary or not? And then just what their hunting styles are. Interesting. I do have one question about otters I have to ask yeah. you. So I was doing some research about them to get ready for this podcast, right? And I read some really interesting facts about their dung. Can you confirm or deny that their dung smells like flowers? 
It definitely no. does not. It does not. Okay. <laughs> I read online that their dung smells like violets. I would violets. love to they know. They are fish eaters. I wonder how that came I, about. I would love to know where you read it. Um, just because when we're giving keeper chats, you always get people, I'm sure you guys experience this with the meerkats and everything, oh my god, they would be a great pet. Oh, and yeah. my first thing is, I was like, as a zookeeper, you know, I've worked with everything from like rhinos, yeah, pelicans, wolves, everything. Otters have the foulest <laughs> fecals of any animal I have ever worked yeah. with. Let's be clear. They're not your, not to bring up a lot of poop talk here, yeah. but they're not. We're zookeepers. We yeah. talk about poop a lot. Yeah, that's true. They're not <laughs> solid. <laughs> yeah. it is, and that's normal. That's yeah, it is an normal. Of. Okay. Yes. It is normal for them to be liquidy, a weird green color, oh, full of fish awful. scales. Smell awful. Well, I'm really glad we debunked that. Yeah. I, was, I was like, I gotta come over and get a whiff not, of this. Not yeah. to mention, they, they like to, uh, I guess, show it off. They 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 use latrines. Mm -hmm. So latrines is a poop site that all of the otters in the area will use, oh. and it acts as kind of like a signpost mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. a largely solitary species so you can tell who else is in the area what their age maybe their reproductive status is so they all poop in the same area and it's usually a pretty prominent place mm -hmm. i'm sorry but can you <laughs> back to the poop. yeah can you imagine like you have to go to the bathroom you're like oh man i'm like four miles away but i gotta get where's back, the, where's the, back to the spot <laughs> where's the it's latrine a good thing that they're full of lots of energy yeah <laughs> But, oh, I didn't realize, like, different... I, I mean, it makes sense for, like, a family yeah. unit. But, like, ones that are not related, they don't yeah. live together, they'll all use yeah. the same one. Yeah, and it, wow. there's a lot of postulation. I, I, I've read about, like, Eurasian river otters who, who do it as an indicator of, hey, I've used this resource recently. You might want to try a different one. Oh, wow. Or, like, like, some Eurasian river otters on the coast will, like, use fresh water baths and then poop next to it afterwards and it's kind of a sign that there's probably a lot of salt in this fresh water bath right now i just used it wow so it's kind of like of communication. a communication yeah. yeah it's a type of communication that kind of facilitates everyone not wasting the time <laughs> wow they're nice to each other yeah <laughs> sharing the info but mark they don't smell like flowers but they do the poopy dance that yeah. everyone does see all i've over heard the of that internet. as well yeah oh, that is the really scat is. dance yes. kind of yes. thing yes. Yeah. you can come over anytime and wesley will put on a show <laughs> so for the record it's 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 like they split their tail up mm -hmm. and they stomp their back feet real yeah deep. and they oh. wiggle their butt <laughs> wiggle their butt go to the bathroom <laughs> oh when is when is a good time for visitors to see them do they have a more active time are they diurnal or crepuscular or they're typically called crepuscular Okay. Here at the zoo, they're pretty active. We always say that the time you're least likely to see them is probably going to be mid-afternoon, right when the sun's up highest and it's hottest. They're getting a snooze. That's when they're typically yeah. getting a snooze in. Mm -hmm. But, like, mornings are usually a good good choice. Uh, whenever we have after-hours programs, they tend to be more active around uh, dusk as well. Do they sleep a lot? You know, some animals conserve a lot of energy by sleeping, but these guys sound so playful. Yeah, they do have a high metabolism, so that helps with a lot of their energy, but being crepuscular, they're just going to nap during the hottest parts of the day, too. And they burn a lot of energy swimming, and if you're mm. Wesley, you just burn a lot of energy bouncing everywhere. Yeah. So. <laughs> and I don't know if we've talked about crepuscular before, but most yeah. active at dawn and dusk, so mm -hmm. for yes. anyone listening, that's you hear like nocturnal or diurnal, yeah. but crepuscular is what a lot of animals actually are. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's one that's like forgotten a lot, because I feel like when you're a child, you learn like... They're either awake during the day or the night. Yeah, and that's you it. learn yeah. the word nocturnal <laughs> yes. and you're like, oh, everything is nocturnal because people believe like wolves are nocturnal. And it's like, nope, they're crepuscular. Yeah. Like most other animals, mm -hmm. just like when you want to nap during the hottest part of the day. And yeah. a lot of animals change throughout the year. Mm -hmm. Otters are super seasonal, so their activity patterns change throughout the year. So obviously right now in the middle of summer, the hottest part of the day they don't really want to be active, but in the middle of winter, that might be a great time to that be active because it's warmest. Yeah. Huh. Now, do you notice our otters have a favorite time of year? They have a favorite season? Ooh. That's a hard one. Wesley's is winter. Yeah. Because, He's a winter guy? Yeah, okay. he definitely loves just sliding on the ice and playing in the snow. <laughs> and then they're out all year. You know, it's not as hot and muggy. They get some extra snacks because we do have seasonal diet changes for them. I would say Wesley's a winter yeah. guy. I don't know if Sugar has a favorite. I don't think she yeah. does. 
Uh, maybe fall. She likes to put leaves on her head. <gasps> Me too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, she's also, if you ever see pictures of an otter with a clam on their head, it's, probably sugar. it's sugar. It's sugar. <laughs> and it is deliberate. She's not getting them there accidentally. You'll see her, like, try and situate it and oh balance my gosh. on her head. Oh, man. So she she likes her hats. <laughs> she likes her cute little hats. Oh, man. Well, Mark, do you have trivia today? I want to say, if you two are up for it, I do have trivia <laughs> for you today. Otter-related trivia, obviously. We'll see how well we do. And yeah. as you just mentioned, we do have, there are 13 species of yes, otters out yes. there. So this trivia, it involves a, a couple of different species <laughs> okay, of okay. trivia today. So we got, it's true-false today. So, okay. Jenna, this is your favorite oh, wow. kind of trivia. I have a 50-50 chance. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's more pressure. I don't get partial credit. <laughs> <laughs> So, first question we have is dealing with sea otters. Okay. So, is We've it read about this. <laughs> yeah. True or false, sea otters have the thickest fur of any animal. That's very true. true. Very, very is true. Is it? True. Yes. Uh, what about true. chinchillas? Thicker than chinchillas. Thicker than, it is somewhere around 800,000 hairs per square inch. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. twice as thick as river otter density wise. And then compared to us, we have about a hundred thousand hairs on our whole head. Wow, that's so, insane! They have more than a head, of, eight heads of hair in one square in inch. One square <laughs> inch of fur. Yeah. They have no blubber, so they yeah. rely solely on that fur to keep them warm in marine environments. Wow, that's incredible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're and they live as far north as Alaska, yeah. so yes. we're talking about freezing cold waters. Yeah. They need yep. to survive yeah, in. Yeah, because when you think of fur. any other aquatic mammal. Uh, they all have fat, basically. That makes sense. Besides manatees, manatees of yeah. course. <laughs> but you're but catching a theme in our department. Yeah. <laughs> no blubber. <laughs> Sometimes fur. <laughs> manatees don't have very thick fur. Yeah. <laughs> Just long hairs. Yeah. Just long hairs. All right, one for one so far. Next up, we're talking about our river otters we have here. True or false? River otters can hold their breath for up to twenty minutes. False. That that's mm -hmm. manatee length. Ooh. That's a long... False, false. Yeah. I'll give you bonus points if you can say how long they can hold eight their breath for. Eight minutes? Yeah, everything I wrote was eight to ten minutes. Yeah, yeah between eight yeah, to ten minutes. Yeah, we always tell people about eight to ten when yeah. we are... Yeah, and that's true on what we've been able to watch with them also. Yeah. And they usually don't go that long, mm -mm. but they can. Yeah. <laughs> that's what I say about hippos, too. Yeah, yeah I would say we, we experience the same thing with our yeah. hippos. They can't hold their breath longer, but they don't need to, so... Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Why would like, you force into yeah. it? <laughs> Alright, good start here. Next question I got... A group of rest. We're back to sea otters. Okay. A group of resting sea otters is called a bloat. No. False. Isn't it float or it's something? It's a raft. Yeah. I knew that one. I got to raft. see that in Monterey Bay. That was yes. so cool. It's a raft. Yeah. All right, then do you know what a group of river otters is called? <laughs> oh, no. Trivia for me. Trivia. Yeah. trivia for me. I was I not like ready it. for this. Um. If that's a raft for sea otters, I bet river otters are like a, a canoe. <laughs> That's a good one, I mean, you find canoes at lodges, and a lodge is one of the things that they can be called as a group. Interesting. Or a romp. So, a romp or a lodge oh. of river otters. I Just, like a romp. I a like romp. Yeah. <laughs> Just gave me an idea. If this isn't, in fact, our 100th episode, I think I want. You're going to do. I'm doing trivia for you. On yes. Let's episode. go. Yes. <laughs> Just a hundred questions. Just list them all. Just a whole podcast of questions. <laughs> Oh man, yeah, it's called a ramp though, and I've seen photos of them like tying each other with kelp. They'll like attach each <laughs> attach to each other with kelp. It looks precious. Yeah, a raft of sea otters. All right, next up, we're going down to those giant river otters okay. we're talking about in the Amazon, down the Amazon oh, River. Oh, it's a hard one. True or false? Giant river otters can get up to six feet long. I'd say with tail. I would yeah. Say true. Yeah, true. 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 Yeah. True. Yeah. Jenna, spot on. <laughs> <laughs> True. It. Yeah, up to six feet long, which is insane. I, I'm curious. Do you know how long our river otters are? Maybe I would guess like three, three maybe three, four feet. Yeah, yeah. That includes but tail. Yeah, yeah. Substantially bigger. I've seen <laughs> yeah. them before in, in zoos, and they are you have? massive. What zoos yeah. have them? I don't remember where I was when I saw huh. them. To be honest, at the otter keeper workshop, there's only like five facilities that Atlanta? joined there that oh. had them. I've been there, I think it was Atlanta. I'd have to yeah. double check amazing. though. River otters and sea otters are definitely the most common within zoos. And then, and Asian, then small Asian small clods. And then there are very, I think there's maybe one facility that has spot-necked otters. Yeah. But, yeah. Giants wow. are pretty rare also. I've been to so many zoos, I get them mixed up. I'm going to have to double check okay. it back to you, Jen. I'll I want to go. <laughs> get back to the listeners next podcast. I'll let you know where giant river otters are. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, next question I've got here. This is the last one. In Monterey Bay, there was a notorious otter named Otter 841. It was for the, the tag number it had. <laughs> otter 841 went viral for stealing a boat. True or false? False. It was false. a surfboard. Surfboard. They're on top of it. Killing it. Five Don't worry, for five. We passed those articles around the department. Yeah. Like, oh, yes. Looking forward to our sea otters. Yeah. Apparently, this this sea otter had stolen multiple surfboards yeah. yes. from surfers in the area. Does he float on them? Yeah, there's yeah. photos of he them like on the He, like, climbs surfboard. up on them. Yeah, you can, you'll find so, pictures so of So resourceful. It. Yeah. Yeah, it's, oh it's some really cute photos, I'm going to be honest, with this otter on the surfboard. I don't know what drove it to steal these surfboards, but they were putting up notices, like, yeah. around the beach, like, watch out for aggressive otter, or, like, protect your surfboard. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> don't just let them have it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my gosh. Oh, cute. man, like, you killed it 100% today on trivia. I'm going to Yeah. <laughs> Jenna, do we have anything else for our guests while they're here? If you guys don't have anything else, did we miss anything yeah. you wanted to cover? I don't think so. Okay. Well, then my final question is, what can I do? Yeah, so what you can do for otters, there's... Obviously, we've talked a lot about how important waterways are. Mm. Uh, so keeping them clean is really important, and keeping them clean and free of outside influences is really important. One of the best things I rec always recommend is using fertilizer wisely and appropriately. And when possible, reducing or eliminating fertilizer mm -hmm. use altogether. And you're like, what does that have to do with otters? Well, when you put fertilizer down on your lawn, a lot of the times what happens is rain comes down and washes it off your lawn into local watersheds. And there, that fertilizer can fertilize all sorts of microorganisms. There are things called algal blooms that occur when there's too much fertilizer or too many nutrients of that type in the water. And it causes huge algal blooms that'll use up all of the oxygen in the surrounding waterways. And that can kill off a ton of fish. Mm. It can kill off all sorts of plant life in the water. It can cause all sorts of issues in the water. And anytime you have a problem like that in the water, that effect goes downstream to the predators. So if there's no plants, there's no fish. If there's no fish, there's no otters. So we always say eliminate fertilizer if you can, and if not, use it sparingly and responsibly. One of the big things we always say is never fertilize right before it rains. Not only is that uh, pointless for your right. end, it's all washing <laughs> off, money. but also it ends up in the waterways, which you also don't like. That's a good one. We haven't touched on that, and yeah. it fits perfectly with otters. So yeah. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. We've talked about pesticides in the past and how mm -hmm. that runoff affects all the water yeah. life, but fertilizer is a great one. And Jenna, I know you've mentioned in uh, a What Can I Do segment in the past, like as an alternative to fertilizer, just when your leaves fall in the winter, or in the winter, when your leaves fall in the fall, let your leaves sit on your lawn. Yeah, it naturally that's... fertilizes your lawn mm -hmm. and provides those kind of nutrients that you get yeah. through fertilizer. That's, it's not to mention it provides all sorts of hidey holes for all the local mm -hmm. critters Keeps on your lawn, yeah. too. Yeah. And yeah. There's yeah. something really silly about raking leaves to put them in a plastic bag. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then in the bag. Yes. yes. Well, thank you guys for being here. We really appreciate you uh, taking the time out of your day, telling us about the otters. And um, we hope everybody listening learned something and had a great time and have a great week. Yeah, definitely. Thanks for joining us again. Yeah, we thanks for having it. us. Thank you guys so much. It. Yeah. Until next time, everyone. Thanks for tuning in to another episode. Take care.